welcome. I don't need these yet. Um, welcome to the Geffen Playhouse. My name is Gil Cates Jr. I am the executive director. And welcome to Raising the Curtain on Actually, a show that we are very proud to uh, be premiering here at the Geffen in a co-world premiere with the Williamstown Theater Festival. I'd like to thank our panelists and introduce uh, John for taking the time to join us. And, and, and one other uh, thank you. Sorry, John, it was a tease. It's the way it was written. Just want to thank you all for being here. It's so important and wonderful that you're here. And uh, we're going to send a survey out after. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, that would be great. It helps us continue to find grants for events like this. So thank you for when you get that. And uh, without further ado, John Horn. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Does everybody have the program that, okay, good. If you don't have one, you can pass it along because I hate when people come up and read CVs of the panel. So I'm just gonna introduce our group, uh, playwright Anna Ziegler. <laughs> Director Tyne Raffaelli. <laughs> Student activist Shaban McCarthy. and attorney and playwright spouse, Will Miller. So we're gonna talk for uh, maybe 40 or so minutes and then we'll take audience questions. My quick question to everybody here is, by show of hands, how many people have seen the play? Great, and the people who didn't put up their hands, how many are going to see the play? Okay, good. There may be miniature spoilers here, but I don't think we're gonna ruin it. Um, and I don't think there really is a spoiler because I think it's uh, an experience that is kind of unique to each person who comes to see the play. So nobody dies. How about that? Everybody's alive at the end. Fair. That is the only non-spoiler spoiler I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you about the origins of the play. Um, was it a conversation over the dinner table with your husband or was it something you were noticing in the press? Where did the story begin for you? Um, yeah, well, it, it's really both, um, but there, there was a, a vacation that our family was on, uh, or was meant to be a vacation, I think this was probably three years ago now, um, that um, was destroyed because Will was in the, we were at the beach, I don't think we made it to the beach very much because Will was holed up uh, in the midst of reworking um, and revising uh, NYU sexual misconduct policy. And uh, ever since that uh, destroyed vacation, it's been um, a huge you know, topic in our home and, and certainly, um, I was saying to you before uh, we walked out here that you can't not research this play. Um, I mean, this topic is everywhere right now. Um, so uh, it's sad and fascinating and um, every case I read about is different and interesting and you know, you can't capture all of them, certainly. Was this drawn from a specific case, an amalgam of cases, an imagined case? Certainly an amalgam or an imagined, no, nothing specific. Um, but, but I would say, you know, drawn from the kind of case that um, feels very murky. Um, and certainly not all do, but um, but I, being a playwright, I'm interested in the kind of uh, you know circumstance where um, what happened isn't isn't clear, and uh, and the audience has to kind of figure out what they think for themselves. Well, I'm going to quote from something that you were working on when your vacation was destroyed. Uh, this is NYU's sexual misconduct, relationship violence, and stalking policy. It was adapted, uh, adopted last October, I believe. And this is a paragraph about affirmative consent. And I think it really gets to the heart of what this play is about. I'm going to quote it verbatim now. Okay. Silence or lack of resistance in and of itself does not demonstrate consent. That is the sentence. Right. Which probably took a long time to come to a lot of debate, a lot of conversations, but it's really important, that idea of what is and is not consent and what silence does, and I guess using the word actually, mean. So why is that sentence important, and how did you come to come up with these definitions? Well, the, um, 
The sentence is important because I think one of the sort of the guiding principles behind a lot of schools' policies in this area is getting away from the concept of no means no. So the idea that if somebody says um, no, then it's non-consensual, but if they don't say no, then it was consensual. So it's, it's, it's the notion that um, just because the other party didn't say an explicit no doesn't mean that it was consensual. I, I mean, you really have to take into, into account the entire totality of the circumstances, um, body language, and the like uh, in determining whether or not it was consensual. I have one more legal question. A lot of the conversations around this issue involve Title IX. For people who don't know what Title IX is and how it changed under President Obama, what, are, what, is Title IX, what was Title IX historically and how did it change a couple of years ago? So Title IX is a, um, a very short federal law that just prohibits um, a sex-based discrimination in, in the educational sector. Uh, traditionally, it's been associated with the sports world. So, uh, colleges and universities have to have equal um, opportunities for both genders um, in terms of the, the sports opportunities that are available. It's uh, the way it's, um, what's changed somewhat uh, is that, or, or a fair amount, is that um, the federal government has issued guidance over the past five, 10 years that, ba that has um, basically said that if, um, if a school doesn't respond appropriately to reports of sexual assault, that that in and of itself can create a hostile environment on campus and lead to a violation of Title IX. Shaban, you go to school across the street and you're involved in an organization called Violence Intervention and Prevention, uh, which I believe is part of the Greek system at UCLA, is that right? It is, yeah. Um, the Greek system is a very high risk environment on our campus, so um, we felt that Although we do reach out to other organizations on campus, it's mainly oriented towards Greek students. So let me ask you this. As a student, when you arrive on campus, are there any conversations as part of freshman orientation or when you're pledging to a fraternity or sorority mm -hmm. about what the law is and what the school can do to protect students and the way in which you need to, the things that you need to know to make sure that you don't end up in a situation like this? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, every freshman is required to go through a process where um, they show a video, they give you all the statistics. Um, and when you join a Greek um, organization, you have to do the same thing again. So the biggest point of the VIP program is to kind of like shake that up a little bit because um, UCLA noticed that people sit through those presentations, but that's really all they're doing. They're just kind of sitting there. Um, they get told the statistics over and over, and like that really doesn't do that much as a student for you. You just kind of see it and don't really know what to do with it. So um, the program's a little more interactive, which is something that uh, really benefits the community. A huge part of the play involves drinking and excessive drinking. In fact, there's a line that you write about pre-gaming, which was a concept that was alien to me before a character in this story goes out, he has five drinks, three shots and two beers. So Shabana, I wanna ask you about that concept of pre-gaming and binge drinking and the culture in which a university student finds him or herself kind of as part of that story. As in how it ties into... How real is it? How, what how is binge drinking? Yeah. <laughs> Very real, that's absolutely um, something that's real. It, um, I mean, for the most part, pre-gaming just kind of is the whole game for <laughs> most people, I guess. Um, you just kind of go and it continues from there and just continues to get blurrier, so there's really no division between a pre-game and actually going to a party. Um, and for some people, that's all they really have to do on the weekend, so um, it's just kind of pervades the campus as like an environment that people engage in. And is it really. peer pressure? Is it, I mean, because I think once you get older, you'll recognize that being hungover is not nearly as much fun as being <laughs> drunk. Um, but I'm curious about the motivations. Is it a group dynamic? Is it something that people enjoy? I'm trying to understand the dynamic. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think it's peer pressure so much as just something you're, you think people expect you to do. 
Um, it's just something that the media portrays. It's Greek life, all they do is party. Um, pretty much anyone that you talk to will be like, well, yeah, that's, what, that's why you're here, um, which is not true, but um, that's just something that um, pervades everything else. So I guess it's not, yeah, you can't not do it because then you won't be accepted, but like I'm doing it because um, this is what I should be doing. This is what everyone tells me I should be doing. So I'm doing it and I'm enjoying it. So. Tyne, for people who have not seen the play, and even those who have, have seen the play, your actors have to engage in not only a lot of dialogue, but some very interpersonal drama. And it's a very revealing play, even though the actors are obviously playing characters, it's a very personal performance. What did you find out about the story through rehearsals that informed the story that you were telling and what your actors brought to it and the tone you were trying to strike through rehearsals? Uh, I'll try and answer as many of those I as I can. I, I know there's like multi-part yeah. questions, sorry. Yeah. I mean, the thing that I think we discovered in rehearsal, you know, you start a rehearsal process and you're in a dialogue with the actors about the choices that they are making. And what we discovered to our fascination and what was very inspiring about this piece is that every choice we made, there is another choice. Every time we named something, it could be something else. This piece is exquisitely ambiguous. And to try and uh, allow the actors to make choices while also having all the other choices be possible is a very delicate and intricate thing. So it's really a process of layering, where we make a choice, we go through the entire piece and we make a certain choice. Then we go through the entire piece again and we make another choice and all of those choices sit on each other, hopefully resulting in a very complex experience so that the audience don't know. So the audience's sympathies are constantly shifting between one or the other. So I think that's what we really discovered during the rehearsal process is that there are so many choices and that we had to be really um, committed to being comfortable and embracing the ambiguity of it. So that's one thing. And then the other thing in terms of the acting of it, which again, I don't know if I knew as clearly as I do now, is what is it to be truly present with an audience? Uh, I think one of my designers said after one of our first tech sessions, the more artifice we put on this thing, the more it feels like fiction. And so actually our process was stripping away artifice. And what is it for two actors to really truly be present with a group of people like this and really tell their story with as much humanity and as much truth as possible? And that's actually way harder than any of us know to stand in front of a hundred people and to really be authentic and truthful. You know, you think about acting and you think about stage work and you think about performance and you think about fantasy. And of course, in some ways it is, it is a fiction as Anna has said, but in terms of honoring the quality of this writing, which is so human, um, and so honest, we had to go through a pretty rigorous process with the actors about how to truly be present and how to strip away any artifice. And I, and I would add just how to be okay living in the ambiguity. I, I mean, the first week I was here, I think there was a, an attempt or they kept asking sort of, so what's the answer? You know, what, uh, who, what are we really to make of these people and what are we to make of this play? And um, what really happened, what was the outcome of this hearing, and, you know, I, I uh, uh, was very evasive. You punted. I punted. I Which has got to be incredibly um, frustrating to yeah, an actor. So I, I'm not going just, to tell you. Just, just there to torture them, right. basically. But telling the actors do something else, and that is that they look the audience in the eyes. Yeah. They are directly addressing the audience as if they were in that hearing which is, I suspect, part of the design to integrate the audience into the judging and the weighing of the ev evidence. Yes, that's correct. And actually, it's even more complex than that because we have really three modes of communication or three realities. We have the hearing itself, as you say. We have the date, the night in question where this thing happened. But then we also have another reality, which is some unnamed time after this entire event has happened where they're looking back and they are trying to understand 
what happened. So shifting between those realities is a very complex, a complex process and also casting the audience and understanding what the relationship is between them and their listener is really important. And you know, they go into a lot of detail and what is that to go into a lot of detail about a story? There's something about them needing the listener to have all the information in order that the listener can help them assess what happened, even if it means saying to them, you were wrong or guilty or there is something that you did that was, that was questionable. So that, that was a really interesting thing to name an objective. What do you want from the audience? And uh, as part of this exquisite ambiguity, you've also created backstories for the characters. So the audience and the story is not just about the events, but it's about the events and the life that led up to the night in question. Why was that important to you? And how does that add to the complications of the story in terms of what happened on the night in question? Right. Well, I guess <laughs> one thing I'm, I'm continually drawn to as a playwright is uh, getting inside the heads of people during events where we are only observers. So, I, for instance, I have another play that's about a tennis match, and, you're, and it goes back and forth between the two players and what they're thinking during the match. So in some ways, this is a, a version of that. Um, but I, I think it's uniquely theatrical to sort of make that attempt. Um, and as, as far as giving them backstories, um, the, goal, the goal is simply to, to show or, or um, investigate with the audience the idea that you know, if in any courtroom case, we knew much more about each person um, than what was simply being presented uh, as evidence, would we feel differently um, about what the outcome ought to be? Um, and I think certainly the answer is yes. Well, in popular culture and in the real world, people understand you know, some of the standards of, of proof, uh, preponderance of the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. If there is a Title IX administrative hearing about sexual misconduct, what, what are the rules that govern it? Is it like a real court system? Is it something akin to itself? Well, no, so it's, I mean, it's quite different from um, the, you know, particularly the criminal court system because it's, as you mentioned, it's a very different standard of proof. In, in, a, in a criminal court system, um, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. And in, uh, in these hearings on colleges and university campuses, the, the standard is what's called preponderance of the evidence. And what that means is, is it, I mean, I think the easiest way to understand it is simply is it more likely than not? So I've, I've heard two accounts, and so the adjudicator's decision is, when I take everything into account, all the evidence that I've heard, which one do I think is more likely? That's, um, and then in terms of the, the sort of rules of evidence, it's just a lower, it's a lower threshold. It's really, um, with some exceptions, it's primarily whether or not the adjudicator feels that a piece of evidence or, or a panel um, feels that a piece of evidence is going to help them, is relevant to them making that decision. Um, there's a new book that I think anybody who's seen this play or is thinking about seeing the play should read um, because it's a interesting perspective on some of the issues that this play is addressing. It's called Unwanted Advances, Sexual Paranoia Comes to Campus. It's by a Northwestern professor named Laura Kipnis. And it's very much a polemic. And it's very much has a point of view but I'm gonna read something from it and I'm gonna ask all of you to kind of react to it because the way in which this author sees this issue, it is as much an issue of feminism uh, as it is about sexual assault. And what she says is often very controversial. So I'm gonna let her words speak for themselves and then we can react to them. And this is from her introduction. She's going through kind of what happens on campus. She says, none of this is to diminish the reality of sexual assault. At the same time, we seem to be breeding a generation of students, mostly female students, deploying Title IX to remedy sexual ambivalences or awkward sexual experiences 
and to adjudicate relationship disputes post breakup. And campus administrators are allowing it. If this is what feminism on campus has come to, then seriously, let's just cash it in and start over because this feminism is broken. I'm not gonna comment on it, but I want you guys to think about what she's saying about placing sexual politics on a college campus in a broader conversation about fem feminism. I'm gonna start with you because you're closest. Yeah. I mean, I, I just finished that book and it's fascinating. Um, there are, I think you, you may have chosen the most extreme statement <laughs> to read out loud, um, which is your job, you did it, you did it well. Um, I, I mean, I found, um, what was in some ways most compelling about her book, this idea that, um, that, that where feminism has gotten us to um, is, a, is in some ways, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use an example that she uses, um, that because women are, are now feeling like they should go toe to toe with men, they're now drinking as much as men, and they and they don't want they don't want to fall behind um, on a night of drinking, and that what that can lead to um, is bringing us back backwards, um, so that so that women cannot as easily. I mean, this is this is she has a whole chapter about drinking, which is where I'm pulling this from. Um, that it's harder to say no when you are. Um, blackout drunk, uh, and that for men, um, it's like we're dividing into sort of more gendered places again, um, that, and that drinking enhances that or, or uh, makes, it, um, uh, makes it hard, you know, it's, it's, it's harder to avoid falling into those traps. Um, now, obviously, it's, it's all hugely controversial, um, and you, and you know, and she says a number of times in the book that she sort of skirts along the kind of victim blaming line, um, and we all have to be really careful about that, especially when we talk about drinking. Um, but you know, I, I'm fascinated by this stuff, and I, and it certainly was in my mind when I was writing this play about what, what role each person is bringing to to this event, and and what culpability, and what certainly what our culture's culpability is in the way that, that women are raised. Well, I'm gonna ask you this because you're on the front lines and you are seeing these cases and you're probably seeing a lot more of them now than you might have five years ago. So what's right? Because I hadn't seen any five years ago. Since okay, anyway. so that's, that's, that's a great yes, fact. Absolutely, yes. So <laughs> what is driving that is that the law has changed, that women are speaking up, that there are more assaults. Something is different. So what is it? Have you tried to figure out why there are so many cases like this now? I, 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 don't, know, I don't know what is different. I mean, ex except f to say that I think that there was a huge advocacy movement that, um, that let's say, reached an um, effective peak and really got the sort of uh, federal government's attention. And there was... Um, uh, sort of a lot of focus on it uh, that culminated in this guidance letter from the federal government called the Dear Colleague Letter. Um, I, I, it's hard to say whether or not, um, let's say, the prevalence of sexual misconduct incidents has gone up. My, my own sense is it probably hasn't over the last 10 years or 20 years, but it's just, um, uh, it's just more vis much more visible um, in, in sort of in the, in the public perception and in uh, the, the understanding of what a university has to do in response to it. Um, but the, the, I, I also wanted to just to um, say my own, my own sort of response to, to that statement from, from Laura Kipnis is that um, I think, I mean, as you said, like I, I actually, so in, in my job, what I do, one of, the, one of my jobs is to um, I sit in on these hearings and I, I advise the person who's making the ultimate decision. Um, and, uh, and, and so my own sense when I read how people try to sort of characterize these cases is that, um, is that it's, they're impossible to pin down because they come in every permutation. I mean, sometimes these cases are, um, you know, it's a simple, this person says this per happened, and this person says something completely different happened. Um, 
Sometimes they completely agree about everything that happened and it's a more refined decision of simply, was this person so drunk that a reasonable person would say that person could not rationally consent to sexual behavior? Uh, and those are very different types of cases and, and um, this is sort of a long-winded way of saying that, uh, I, I mean, I, I would say Certainly, it's possible that something like that dynamic happens from you know in in certain cases, but uh, but certainly not all, and I would say probably not most. Um, so that's my own my own view. Shaban, what about you? I mean, it's a very complicated question about you know feminism and about owning your own body and owning your own sexuality, and certainly not to dis discount that sexual assaults do happen. So what does it feel like on campus? Um, well, I will say that um, to the comment about using Title IX as a, as a resource to uh, assuage awkward encounters and things like that, I think feminism is a reason why these cases are being talked about more. I think that women are now feeling more comfortable. It's not just their burden to be like, well, this happened to me and I have nowhere to go. Um, I think it's really important to note that women now feel comfortable talking about it because there's a platform to do so. Um, so I think that's incredible. Um, the other thing that I'll say, though, is that even at that point, women are still afraid to report things because of, you know, I have friends that will disclose things, and but I'm not going to report it to Title IX because what can they do for me? And that's not to discount <laughs> what you're doing, but, like, it's just a complicated process that's very taxing on a person. So... Um, having something that's a little more small scale than going to a full-blown courtroom is sometimes just what you need instead of, you know, carrying out everything. Tyne, did you have conversations in rehearsal about this issue about, you know, where does it place, and I guess this is really about the female character in the uh -huh. story, about what, what these conversations mean in her story? Yeah, it's, it's a very complicated question. And I think what Anna does incredibly successfully in the piece is contextualize her experience. So you start to understand in a way that I don't think we do in day-to-day -day life, even in the press, um, how this young woman has been conditioned in a certain way, even unconsciously by parents, by teachers, by friends, to think about sex in a particular way and not to feel um, like she has a voice in those sexual dynamics and also that even somebody as smart as her and she is incredibly intelligent still seeks affirmation, seeks affirmation through <laughs> sex which is just a prolific experience I think for young women in the world today and you look at the press and you look at marketing and you look at advertising and we are still sometimes consciously, a lot of the time unconsciously, bringing young women up in the world to seek affirmation that way and also to not feel empowered within sexual dynamics. So when they are given a platform in which they suddenly do have a voice, yes, it might be com complicated and it might be, yes, as Will said, it's incredibly complex and I'm sure there are realities where that is true and I'm sure there's a ton of realities where that's not true but I think what's so interesting about our our young women in our play and what Anna has um, done so precisely is as I say contextualize her uh, upbringing and her sexual evolution as we keep calling it in rehearsal and that is something that is not talked about very much and something that is normalized and something that I believe all of us, me included probably, is, are doing unconsciously to young women. And I want to ask you about a line that Amber has in the play, and you may have, might have changed it a little bit, but it's about her relationship to her own body. And she says, what's this body I'm inside of, this body I hate that never does what I want it to do? It's, a, it's an incredibly sad thing, this, this awkward relationship that she has with her own self physically and how sex complicates it. What are you trying to get at there and why was that important to include in the story? Um, I mean, I think, as, as you say, it's the, I mean, this, and that line comes at, in sort of the climax of the play <laughs> um, when I think this 
woman is starting to realize or, or put things together um, for herself about uh, what she brought with her into this, um, into this hearing and into the date. Um, and that, uh, that, yeah, that sex and body image um, are inextricable um, and that there's uh, absolutely, um, I, think, I think, no way for, for girls growing up now to, to feel healthy and good about their bodies. This is not, this is not even, I mean, you'll, you know, the actress in, in this role um, is, uh, is not someone, um, I mean, you could cast this role in many different ways, but um, this, this woman has probably a very traditionally um, uh, good body, and yet that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't mean anything. Everyone feels horrible about their bodies, and, and it has, um, it has horrible repercussions. No, and I think one of her, I think her mother has said she's pretty enough, which is about the worst thing that a parent can ever say about a child, right? No, I mean that. It's horribly damaging. Well, when you're reading your wife's play and she's describing <laughs> what a hearing looks like and what it sounds like, what is the conversation that you have about authenticity, about the things that you felt were very important to get right? I'm trying to think of an example. Um, I mean, I think in, 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 uh, I think the best I can do is sort of in general terms. I mean, the, the, the sort of feedback I gave her about authenticity is just um, uh, the types of things. I mean, particularly when um, uh, both before, during the hearing and before, uh, um, the types of things that the that the two students are saying that the sort of campus administrators said. Um, so in 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 those cases. Uh, uh, are sort of the most the ones that jumped out to me that I would say either well, I just I it, I do think that would happen or or it would be, happen slightly differently or the question would be phrased slightly differently. I mean, actually, um, one uh, one thing I do remember um, specifically is that I think that there was something about the the uh, the I think maybe a, there was a reference to a campus administrator using the term rape, um, which is actually uh, is. I mean, it depends on the school, but um, I, I think I think the thing that I mentioned to Anna was simply that it, there is it's, it's campus administrators are very careful to use the um, the terminology of the policy at issue. So mm -hmm. most schools don't use the sort of criminal term rape because what's at issue is not um, whether or not a crime has been committed, but whether or not there's been a policy violation, and uh, and so then it's not whether rape occurred, but whether or not non-consensual sexual intercourse happened or whether or not sexual assault or whatever term it might be. So that kind of thing. Anna, there's certain directors who want to send an audience out feeling a certain way and feeling unanimous about that certain way. And I suspect your design in directing this play is that the more arguments people are having in the lobby, the better you have succeeded? Is that fair? Absolutely. In the lobby, in the car on the way home, dinner table that night, dinner table the next night, yeah. We have both uh, committed ourselves to asking more questions than answering them. And every time we come into rehearsal, we try and better articulate the question of the play, but we cannot ever answer it except by ask asking better questions. So yes, we have both committed to that. So before we take audience questions, I wanna ask this last question of you, Anna. Um, narrative stories can illuminate a greater truth they can illuminate the truth that nonfiction storytelling can't do. And yet, as your director just explained, this is a play that probably raises as many questions as it does answer them. Mm -hmm. So what was your intention in writing it in terms of what you want its conversational outcome to be? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a hard question to ask a playwright, actually. Like, um, uh, but I, I would hope that that people are talking about consent um, after they see this play, and and how murky that can be, um, and what our expectations, uh, uh, you know, of you know expectations of people, what 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 the, what their responsibility is um, uh, in any of these 
kinds of circumstances um, and how I guess I would hope that it would just provide people with an appreciation for how hard these kinds of things are to adjudicate, to use legal term, um, and that when we read cases like this in the newspaper, there are two real people um, behind them. And I would say the one thing that the play is unequivocal about is that bad things will happen when you drink too much. I mean, very seriously, no, very seriously, that binge drinking is as great a problem as sexual assault is because they often go hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely. On that happy note, uh, we have time for some audience questions. There's a microphone among you, so if you put up your hand, we will make sure the mic gets to you. So down in the front, and just, um, just say who you'd like to answer it or if it's for more than one person. Well, it can be for anyone. CNN had a piece this morning on whether um, the Greeks should be eliminated on campuses. And they started to touch on what some of the offsets would be if they were eliminated. Do you, have you done any thinking about that? That, in other words, a lot of the drinking we're talking about occurs in the fraternities and sororities. Yeah. Will, do you want to, or who? Will, and then we'll get Shaban's uh, counterpoint, point yeah. counterpoint. <laughs> I'm actually going to probably pass on that question about uh, okay. fraternities and sororities. Anna, do you want to talk about it, Anna, then we'll have Shaban? Who wants to I mean, go first? I mean, it just seems like an intractable, intractable problem, and I and I think the this I think the drinking is a huge part of the problem, and what to do about it is mystifying. That's, I mean, I don't know that eliminating the Greek system would uh, would change drinking culture on campuses significantly. What do you think, Siobhan? I will say, uh, UCLA at least their campus. Uh, climate towards Greek life has changed drastically in the past couple years. There's a lot of backlash towards the Greek community currently, and um, a lot of that was, you know, the students perpetuating ideals that they shouldn't have, and a lot of it was the um, the people in charge of us. What is the word for that? The adults that are in charge of <laughs> Greek life. Um, and um, they've done a lot of work to redo their office. They're um, trying really hard to recontextualize what Greek life is and what it should mean on UCLA's campus. Um, but I agree, Greek life is extremely problematic and should be uh, looked at with a much more um, careful eye on what's happening. Next question. Yeah, right here. My question is for Anna. I haven't seen the play yet. I'm very excited to see it. I'll see it tonight. But uh, my question is, did you um, tackle any cultural differences in how rape is viewed or how it's addressed? Um, and if you didn't, why not? Did I tackle any cultural differences? Right. Um, I, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I guess, no. I, I suppose not. Um, I mean, I think I was thinking about how um, colleges are are sort of handling these issues, and and I guess if you mean for each of these two characters what they're sort of bringing to the table, um, I um, yeah, I mean, there's I thought a lot about. Um, you know what it what it was to write a play where a black man is accused of committing a crime and what that means for him and what it means uh, to be accused by a white woman. Um, and there's the play touches on those sorts of things. Um, but you know, again, it really was, um, as Tyne was saying, you know, sort of raising questions more than having any answers about any of that because um, I wouldn't presume to. Uh, I saw quite a hand go up toward the back. Yeah, go ahead. Wait for the mic. It's coming your way fast. Um, hi, I haven't seen the play yet, but I know it's based off of a sensitive topic. And I was just wondering what kind of like props and like stage setups you kind of would use to display that. Um, in this particular context, as little as possible. Um, when you do come and see the play, you'll, as you've heard tonight, see that there's a lot of direct address to the audience. So in that regard, it was very important for us to not dress that up 
as anything other than it is, which is a direct conversation with the audience. And so in terms of um, the larger design of the piece, everything was in support of the audience being able to listen to these two people as closely and intimately as possible. And that's actually a much harder thing than it sounds in terms of how do you allow the audience to listen. And simple work is, again, harder sometimes than complex work because the choice of the envelope of the piece, the choice of furniture, what props you do use when you're not using very much become that much more important. If you have one object on stage rather than 15, that object has a particular charge to it. So I would say in answer to your question that because the writing inspired very precise simplicity and our mission in terms of the larger design of it is how we could allow the audience to listen to these two people as closely as possible. And so that's really been the design process. And to, to answer the question specifically, there are two chairs on stage. I think you're sitting, in, whichever ones are bolted to the stage, <laughs> and there's one prop, there's a note on, in the wings, it says flask, that's it. One prop, two chairs, that is it. I think there's a question right in here. Go ahead, yes. Yes, I'd um, like to thank everyone involved for a fantastic production and as someone involved both as an administrator and a teacher in higher education, I know how much rings true. My question is about um, another aspect that hasn't been raised but really important and complicated repercussions, the reporting requirements in the play as we see the the one character is not initially inclined to do anything and doesn't use the language ultimately that's used, but because of friends and then the system um, changes her mind or, I mean, maybe she's doing the right thing, but maybe she's partly persuaded otherwise. I know of a real world situation that's similarly complex, so I want to describe it as quickly as I can and hear your response. Um, this involves, um, let's say, an off-campus program. So it's a little more complicated, not just legal, the university requirements. So let's say we have a program in a different city where students study but also do an internship. And in the course of that internship, something bad is going on, a case of harassment. Uh, friends of the student notice behavioral changes, mood, increased drinking, medication. It gets to the local director, person working for me, um, he understands the requirements. He hears essentially a description of harassment because she's told her friends, but she doesn't want to report it. But now her friends tell the director and he's required and he reports to me. And when I hear about it, it's essentially, this is what happened, I think, but she is adamant in not wanting to report it. But I have to. Wow. I said, thank you, now I have to. But it, because legally we do, but her argument was something else. is, listen, this job is really important to me. My parents work in, there's a certain complexity, I can't be too specific, but it involves business, a foreign embassy. This will not only foreclose my professional chances, it could ruin my parents. Um, so I'm willing to tolerate it, I can deal with what's going on. Please don't report it and make this an official action. And, and well, we had to. And it got very awkward and there's no easy resolution. It did involve people outside of our university, but wow, was it a mess and not black and white. Well, so, so what I'd say to that is that um, I think there's a bit of a mis, uh, misperception about, um, I mean, you're, you're certainly right that there is a, an obligation on um, what are called responsible employees at a university to report um, incidents uh, like the one that's at the heart of the play or, or a, a sexual harassment type incident to the Title IX coordinator. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there has to be the sort of full bore investigation. Um, there is, uh, most schools have, say like a five or six factor test uh, to try to determine whether or not when somebody says, you know, I don't want an investigation, I don't want repercussions because of this for X, Y, or Z reason, um, in general, the guidance is to respect that. Um, and so uh, the, the, the sort of exception is when a university analyzes under a sort of multi-factor test uh, that they think that, that there is a, a threat to the safety of the campus in some way that, um, that is, for lack of a better word, dire. Um, and then that would sort of override the particular person's wishes for something not to be done. 
But, um, but I, I do think that there's this perception that once it gets to the Title IX coordinator that that automatically means there's gonna be an investigation, a hearing, and that's, it's not the case. Time for a couple more questions. I see three hands up, so let's do the three hands that are up. Go ahead. Yeah, I have uh, a question for Will and then a question for everyone on the panel. Can you talk about why something like rape on campus is dealt with by the uh, institution rather than the police? And then for everyone, can you talk about if you think there's something lost in the, you know, the, the definition of what you started with, John, of consent and that silence does not mean consent. As someone who's of an age where, you know, I can't particularly imagine when I was in college, you know, with young people discovering the mystery and ephemera of sex, you have to look in someone and say, do you agree that I can, you know, do whatever, you know. Is the, is the requirement for absolute um, explicit consent, does that take anything away from young people who are, you know, young and exploring their sexualities and, you know, maybe, I don't know, I'll just leave that. Let's start, let's start with the why is it not pursued criminally or is it sometimes pursued criminally? So the, the short answer is because it's required by law. Um, so the federal guidance and, uh, and actually New York State, um, uh, it's very clear that regardless of whether or not there's police um, involvement, the university universities have an independent obligation to do their own investigation and determine what happened. And again, I think it comes back to the sort of concept I raised earlier about this notion that if, um, you know, I mean, let's just say, like take an extreme example, a univer university is just hearing about multiple assaults that are happening on their campus and they ignore it or do nothing about it or don't sort of try to address that issue. Um, uh, I think the idea is then that in and of itself c could create a hostile environment. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to touch on uh, one thing that, that I think your second question raised, which is, um, Another, I guess what I'd call a bit of a misperception, I think about the sort of guidance and, and uh, school policies in this area, which is that it's, it, the policies are not, um, and obviously there's some variation, but typically that there has to be explicit consent at every, uh, uh, every um, step of the way. And so you know, you've, you've probably you know, heard the term yes means yes. And so the New York has a, has a law that was passed a couple years ago that has been referred to as a yes means yes law. And the reason I say it's, it's, it's a bit um, uh, misleading is because in the, in, in the text of the statute, it specifically says in the definition of affirmative consent, it's words or actions. So it's not, it not, it's not these policies don't say that at every step of the way, the other person has to say yes. It's more, you know, if uh, given prior history between the, the two individuals involved, um, body language, as I mentioned earlier, uh, all of the ways in which somebody can indicate to somebody else that they are um, up for what is happening and what whatever might come next uh, is um, is on the table. It's not. It's not. It doesn't have to be a verbal yes. Shaban, I'm going to put you on the spot in terms of what you and your friends understand consent to be, and do you ever have conversations about it? Absolutely. Um, I mean, as I said before, uh, it's become something that's very routine. It's like the statistics, like everybody knows it. It's revocable. It's ongoing. It's, um, you know, affirmative, things of that nature. Um, but there are instances in which consent isn't something that's explicitly addressed, and I, sometimes it's okay and sometimes it's not, I guess. Um, and that's something that we actually just had a discussion about the other day during one of our chapter meetings, um, trying to define it and why it's important. Um, and it's one of those cliche com conversations where you just have to admit to yourself, like if you're not okay explicitly saying, hey, is this okay what I'm doing? You probably shouldn't be doing it, so. And even though Anna said I read the most uh, provocative passage in Laura Kipnis's book, I think this is even more provocative. <laughs> Sexual consent can now be retroactively withdrawn with <laughs> official sanction years later based on changing feelings or residual ambivalence or new circumstances. Please note that this makes anyone who's ever had sex a potential rapist. 
her words, not mine. Over here. Hi. Yes, my question is for Anna and or Tyne, whoever wants to answer. Um, I saw the play on Wednesday, and I loved it. And one of the things that really shook me is that I've always been like against the culture of victim shaming and victim blaming. And so when she goes into the hearing and they're asking her questions like, what were you wearing and how much are you drinking? Like that really angers me because I think it's, you know, like, like as a woman, it's, it's frustrating. And so seeing this play and then walking out of it, there were so many other factors that make me not want to, like that make me blame her a little bit because it's hard and the lines are really blurred and they have a lot of history that came into the situation. And so walking out of that, it was a little, I was a little shaken up realizing that like it is never easily so black and white. And so my question is what sort of themes in regard to feminism and taking control of your body and standing up for yourself and like in regards to taking responsibility for your actions while still seeking justice for something that you feel isn't right, like was hard for you to struggle with or that you really wanted to highlight in this play? You're like the perfect audience member because those are exactly the questions I think you want to be raised. Who wants to go yeah. after that one? <laughs> yes. We should, I mean, Anna, you could start Anna. with the genesis of something and I can absolutely expand in terms of conversations that came up in the room. Yeah, I mean, I guess... Um, I, I, I feel like the... You know, I, I, what I take from your question is, I mean, I, I think it's wonderful. I, I'm gratified to hear that that you left feeling conflicted. Um, and I think that the the themes that we're trying to to raise or grapple with um, have to do with are are a little bit um, troubling uh, for I mean for women um, and uh, and what. Um, I mean, uh, I don't know if Amy is here, our dramaturg, but she was saying the other day that in some ways um, the character of Amber has the main question of the play, which is has to do with female capitulation. Um, and I, I guess we are, I mean, we, we struggled with it the whole time and, and what we're trying to say about that. Um, and in some ways I think just just, uh, I know, as I keep saying, like a broken record, just raising the question is, is really the goal. And I think the conversations in rehearsal about that specifically, I've already touched on it, but I think is part of a larger question that you may be feeling too, having left the theatre the way you described, is, the, is um, being very careful about making assumptions that women are biologically predisposed to certain behaviors. And that is something that we have been very sensitive about in the room. And I think that is folded into victim blaming is certain assumptions that are prevalent in our culture that need to be addressed, put front and center, unpacked, dismantled understood what women are biologically predisposed to do and then understand how we have conditioned women into certain behaviors and trying to unpack those two and then also trying to celebrate the humanity of Amber, that she's not perfect. She's not a perfect being. Neither of them are perfect beings. None of us, shocker, are perfect <laughs> beings. Um, so do you know what I mean? There's a larger global political conversation, absolutely. And then there's also dealing with this individual who can't represent all women and can't represent the problem altogether, but can articulate what it is to be human, which is a constant contradictory process. <laughs> um, and so the conversation in the room was about that, is trying to unpack any of those assumptions, just the way we did with Tom in a completely different way. Unpack those assumptions and also celebrate what it is to be human. I want to thank you all for coming out and engaging in this great conversation. And equally important, I want to thank our panel, Tyne, Siobhan, uh, Will, and Anna for bringing us this play and this conversation. So thank you. And if you could figure out how to climb up these, this stage, you'd come say hello. <laughs>